wanted to warn you guys about the graphic pictures that will show up. And yeah, my name is Emily. To start off, I'd like you guys to close your eyes. Imagine a family of four. A mother who is a stay-at-home mom, a 16-year-old daughter who is always talking on the phone, a two-year-old girl who is always crying, a 17-year-old boy watching violent television and playing violent video games. One day, the mother tells her children she is going to the grocery store. So they will have to both watch the two year The two teenagers sigh with anger, but give in. Although they were told to watch her, they went on doing their normal routine. The teenage girl on the phone, the boy playing violent video games and watching violent movies, and the little girl crying for her mother. Later, the, mom, the mother comes home an hour late, parks the car in the garage, opens the door with struggle due to the bags in both hands. But when she enters, her eyes open wide. There are blotches of blood on the floor, against the wall, on the counters, and lastly, on the bodies of the teenage girl and the two-year-old girl. The mother then looks up to see her son with a knife inching towards her. The last thing she sees was a television showing the movie screen. And that's what we are. Well, according to Lucinda Brookings in her article entitled the, media, the effects of media violence on children, 10,000 individuals between the ages of 10 and 17 are arrested due to violent acts in America. Today we will discuss the, the, we will discuss the effects of youth that are exposed to media violence, and by the end of the speech, you will have learned some facts that you can inform your relatives and friends about. And my three main points are violence, whether it's safe or not, and are they really harmless? Television violence, is it fun and a many death involved? And real life violence, can it happen to you and are you safe? To start off, I want to talk about my first main point, which is violence, whether it's safe or not, which was researched by Andrew Bean in his article entitled Video Games and Violence. But there are so many myths about violent video games, and some people believe that there's no leap to aggression when you play video games. But really, there's high level of exposure of the back video. There's high levels of video game exposure that are linked to delinquency, fighting in school, and violent criminal behavior. And another one is unrealistic video game violence is safe for adolescents <coughs> and youth. But really, there was a research that college students that played E-rated games, they had high levels of aggression. And then the last one is the effects of violent video games are a trivial matter. But really, the high levels of violent video games further increases societal costs. Now that I have talked about whether violence is safe or not, we will now go on to whether television violence is fun, which was researched by Robin Rondo in his article entitled Murder by the Numbers. Well, as I mentioned earlier, studies have shown that long-term exposure to violent video games or violence in the media it um, increases aggression. And there's different types of aggression. There's one where you, you, you name call people, the second is where you start pushing and shoving, and the worst is killing others. And here I have a graph of the many homicides, which are murders that happen in Florida, and in different counties. For Palm Beach, it was 210,000, and then it moved up further to 220,000 in Hillsborough, and from Broward County, it stayed the same, while in Pinellas County, it went up more, to 230 in Orange County, it was it went up higher to 280, and the highest, the third highest, was Osceola with 290,000 murders. And then Miami Dade, which was 360, then it, Duval County, which was the highest, was 460. <coughs> now that we have talked about whether television violence is fun, we will now move on to our final topic, which is real life violence and can it happen to you, which was researched by Benedict Carey in her article, Shooting the Child. Well, as you see here, this little boy, he's copying what he sees on television, pointing the gun as Arnold Schwarzenegger points the gun at him as well. The studies show that student, that kids, they are likely to imitate what they see. So as you know, those little kids who are trying to imitate Superman and wearing the little cage running around the house, this is likely with violence seen on television as well. And <laughs> also, when children are exposed to the violence, they start, start 
being less afraid of what they see. So when they see gory, they're not afraid of the blood spraying out or anything. So next, we have um, the Columbine shooting by these two kids. There was Eric Harris and Dylan Clayball, and they were armed with semi atomic guns and shotguns, and they killed 12 students, a teacher, and then you see here they killed themselves. And um, also with that, they they were known to play the violent video game. And, the, and also a bullying was also an af a factor. So as they were bullied, then they thought maybe they could hurt those who they who were bullying them. So they used the violent video games as a way to attack them. So now our final one was a common one we know now about the Columbine the the Colorado shooting that happened in the theater by James Holmes, who he killed around more than 12 people and uh, more than around 70 that were injured. And we, we know that he said that he wanted he was the Joker. So we see from this that people they actually did really copy what is on television. So I want to ask you guys, how many of you are willing to go by hand by GameStop? after class and demand that they do not sell by the video games. Well, if not, then how many of you by show of hands will inform your family members and your friends about what can happen if you are exposed to violence? Well, my name is Ruth and I would um, just ask you guys to close your eyes. Well guys, imagine you are with friends having a good time and you happen to notice an attractive girl, but because you're obese, you can't gather the courage to talk to her. Girls, imagine yourself in a similar situation, out with your girlfriends and knowing yourself. Through the nights, guys come and talk and flirt with your friends. They notice you, but they are not interested enough to start a conversation. Please open your eyes. <laughs> Since 2000, overweight rates have doubled among children and tripled among adults, adolescents, increasing the number of years they are exposed to the health risks of obesity. This information came um, from the website webmd.com fitness. Today I'm going to talk to you guys about the disadvantages of a sedentary lifestyle, and at the end of my speech, you know. how it can lead to obesity. How many people does obesity affect? Lack of exercising, does it affect mental health? How many people do not exercise and suffer from mental health? And exercise, should people take it seriously? Is it a life or death problem? In this picture, we can also see how having a poor diet and lack of exercise is in the second annual death by 365,000 a year. It can how a lack of exercise it can lead to obesity. In nineteen ninety in nineteen eighty we see how obesity it's almost twelve percent in the population with the men and the women. In nineteen ninety how it increases a little bit by six fifteen percent. In nineteen ninety nine we see kind of a big difference of of almost five. In 2000, it's 30%, 30 percent, and in 2010, we see a big difference, big increase of, of almost 50 percent. And research says that if um, the population keeps going like that, in, by 2020, it's going to be almost higher than 60 percent. Also, one of the effects of obesity is type 2 diabetes, which is how your body it's, um, it's not producing enough sugar and it affects your energy, it affects your body. We can see here how in 1980, um, it was 9%, 1990, it was 15%, 1999, it was the same, it didn't increase by much. In 2000, it went a little higher to 20 almost 20%. 2010, it went by 35% and Again, research says how if, if it continues like that, by 2020, the diabetes too will be very high. Also, stroke, 
it's um, when your body, it's uh, well, stroke. In 1980, uh, we see how it was not as high. It was almost 5%. 1990, there's not a big difference either. 1999, it went a little higher by almost 2%. 2000, there was no difference. 2010, it was a little higher as well. And in 2020, of course, they are expecting it to increase as well. This information came by Tree and Health um, website. Not exercising, does it cause mental health? Mental health problems are uncommon. That's what many people think. 20% of people suffers from mental health due to lack of exercise. Mental health are purely biological or genetic in nature. That's wrong. 35% of people who suffer from mental health have been proven to not <coughs> exercise. Exercising is not important. That's wrong. According to the Center for Disease Control, poor diet and lack, and lack of exercise can lead to a plethora of physical and mental health problems. This information came by the website accesspublicinformation.com. Exercise, should people take it seriously? In these pictures, we see how exercise may add years. It has been proven that jogging one to two hours every three or two days a week um, increases at least six years to men and six years to women. This picture, we can see how an obese guy is realizing how it affects his health, his even patterns and he's trying to make an effort to exercise and lose the weight. <clears throat> in these pictures we see how this obese guy is emotional, de emotionally depressed. You can see the medicine, you can see he's smoking inside the house. Um, this is a very serious problem that many people do not know about how exercise can change actually your life. Now, after I talk to you guys about how it affects not exercise and malnutrition, how it affects your body, how many of you guys will go and open a gym membership and you will go seven days a week and change to a healthier lifestyle? Well, how many of you guys understand the importance of being active? How you, how you will try to engage in any physical activity daily to improve my, your health? If not, you will talk to your friends and pass it on to your family. Okay, thank you. Hello, my name is Louis Flayson, and I will begin by first warning you that there are graphic images within this presentation. Now, I would like all of you to close your eyes. Imagine you are in a dimly lit living room in the bad side of town. You are strung up because you haven't had your daily shoot of heroin nor have you snorted your occasional snort of coke. You're itching for a good puff of marijuana, but you have nothing. And you lack the funds. You need it so bad. Suddenly, there's a burst through your front door. Your fears are confirmed. It's your drug dealer, who you owe money to for the last few sets of drugs that he supplied to you. He sits next to you while you just tremble in fear. And he says to you, I thought you would have paid up by now. I gave you some good stuff. My fault for being nice, it won't happen again. You have no time to scream as he drives his favorite knife into your upper side. He leaves you to die as you feel your lungs get colder with the blood that quickly fills them. You can now open your eyes. In 2007, out of 14,831 U.S. homicides, 4% yearly were proven to be drug and money related. That's about 593 yearly, not including any other drug driven crimes. And the information for that statistic was found on the Bureau of Justice Statistics website. Today, I will make it clear to you why illicit drugs are illegal, <clears throat> and by the end, you will know why action is to be taken against them. What will be spoken of goes as follows. Drugs and common mendacities. What are the actual truths about drugs? U.S. drug usage, <clears throat> an ever-growing trend of drug abuse, and the drug wars. 
is drug influence simply a personal danger, or is it a global massacre? Now that you know what we've spoken of, we will begin with drugs and common mendacities. <clears throat> this information was pulled from what is psychology, which is a textbook written by Dr. Pastorino and her associates. <clears throat> a very common mendacity. Drugs are man-made, so anything natural should not be considered a drug. It's completely false. Because a drug is any substance that has a physiological effect when it's introduced to your body. Another very common mendacity you've probably heard. When drugs are only used occasionally, you will be safe from any dangerous side effects. Also completely false. Whether used very little or very often, a drug can produce either reoccurring or permanent effects on your body. In other words, even when the drug is not in use, you might feel the effects it gives you when it is in use. And finally, a very famous one, a drug like marijuana simply only calms a person down, heals their senses, and gives them the munchies, and it causes no harm. False. Marijuana is a hallucinogen. <clears throat> it also distorts a person's senses, numbs their digestive system, and it slows their cognitive processing. When their digestive system is numbed, they will get the munchies, yes. But to say that it causes no harm, that's completely false. Every drug causes some sort of harm, whether it's a pres prescription medication, coke, you name it. And if your cognitive processing is slow, cognitive processing is your thinking process, you're basically being made dumb if it gets slow. So now that we've gone over uh, common mendacities of drugs, <clears throat> we will go to US drug usage. And this information was pulled from CNNHealth.com. <clears throat> According to this graph, numbers in millions, in 2007, around 19 million people in the U.S. used illicit drugs. Okay, And in these next few years that follow, you will see that drugs like marijuana, heroin, coke, um, prescription medications used illicitly, and so on, will actually influence the numbers in these next years. By year 2008, around 21 million people used illicit drugs. By 2009, that jumped to around 21.7 million people. And by 2010, roughly 22 million people were illicit drug users in the US. That's quite a lot of people, those are millions. Now we've gone over US drug usage, we will go over the drug wars. This information was taken from drug cartels, street gangs, and warlords, it is actually a journal uh, that was derived from the small wars and insurgencies. Sorry. Year by year, drug cartels become more problematic, larger in numbers, and more dangerous. Okay, as you can see there, that is a picture taken from Mexico where local Mexican authorities are apprehending drug cartel members. As you can guess, Drug cartels are the top dealers in global drug trade. They're everywhere, South America, North America, Europe, everywhere around the world there are cartels. They don't only sell drugs, they also murder people, <clears throat> literally. As you can see there, those could have possibly been civilians, they could have possibly also been rival drug cartel members. Drug cartels are also known for killing law enforcement all because of the sale of marijuana, cocaine, heroin, crack cocaine, not to be confused with powdered cocaine, and many different types of pill versions of drugs. All for this, the mighty dollar. That's what the drug cartels want, the money. They don't want the drugs, they want the money. So to get that money, they'll sell substances that if used long term, will make you look like this. In the end, I want to ask you something. How many of you are willing to go set out, hunt down, and assassinate any local drug users or dealers in your area to help stop illegal drug use globally and nationally? Okay. 
How many of you will live above the influence of illegal drug use, as well as help lower national or global <coughs> drug using problems by leading those who may need to follow in your example? Thank you very much for your time. Now, um, I would like everyone to close their eyes, please. Okay. Imagine yourself in a cold, freezing room with IVs attached all over your body. No sense. Just the agonizing pain of the chemo running through your veins. Probably the only thought running through your mind is, will I die? Your mind is um, nothing but negative thoughts. You wake up the next day in yet another cold room. But this time, not in a chair, but on a surgical table. Doctor saying, pass me the clamps. You're panicking but can't seem to move. You completely numb. And then you wake up in another room, and this time it's warm. Now, and you find bandages suppressed against your breasts. What can this be? Open your eyes, please. Today I will be speaking about breast cancer. And by the end of my speech, breast cancer will be more important than to you. Um, I want you guys to know that there's graphic pictures throughout the slides, just so you know. And I've gotten this source from What is Breast Cancer, a national breast cancer organization. Each year, it is estimated that over 220,000 women in the United States will be diagnosed with breast cancer, and more than 40,000 will die. Now, I want you guys to know what I'll be talking about throughout my speech. First, I'll be talking about what is breast cancer, understanding breast cancer itself, early detection, are these symptoms affecting you, gender selection, does breast cancer only affect women? Breast cancer is usually dissected in three categories. Sporadic, hereditary, and familial breast cancer. First, as you can see, sporadic breast cancer is actually 70% of people have this cancer. Sporadic breast cancer has no significant family history, and out of 100, 70% have this. Familial breast cancer, which is 20% that are diagnosed with this, is family history is present but it has untested on some cases. And at least with hereditary breast cancer, there's a, out of 100%, there's 10% of people that do have breast cancer. Um, I got this source from, again, the National Breast Cancer Association. It's a breast cancer organization. A lot of people think finding a lump in your breast means you have breast cancer. Unfortunately, that's not true. Only a small percentage of breast lumps turn out to be cancer. They also think if you have family history of breast cancer, you are also likely to develop breast cancer too. Only 10% of individuals diagnosed with breast cancer have a family history of this disease. Another myth is breast cancer is contagious. No, breast cancer is not contagious. You cannot catch breast cancer or transfer it to someone else's body. Um, this, is also, this is from a, cent, a cancer center, which is a documentation. And does breast cancer only affect women? No, breast cancer does not only affect women. Breast cancer does not. It only develops in breast cancer, but it is most common in men who are 60 and 70 of age, about 1% of all breast cancers occur in men, but 2,000 men are diagnosed annually with about 450 deaths due to male. As you can see, this male's at the doctor thinking, hmm, I can't get breast cancer, but yes, he can get breast cancer. This is a photo of a woman who probably found the breast cancer at a really late stage. The stage is when you really can't do anything and basically <coughs> be on your deathbed, but I wouldn't say that for you guys, but as you can see, this isn't the best thing on someone's body. This is just a photo dissecting exactly how the breast cancer trans through, transfers through the breast. The, it affects different parts of the body 
it's, it causes discharge sometimes if you let it, as the previous picture, go further. It actually does discharge, which you did see in the previous slide, and sometimes it's affected in the open area. And this is a male that has breast cancer. As I did say before, breast cancer does affect males as well. Breast cancer isn't something that just because you think big boobs, I guess you could say, um, it's not really that. It's honestly just a part of the chest area that does get infected, unfortunately, with something that looks like this. Now, I'd like to ask all of you, how many of you are willing to go home today and do the self-examination and invite strangers to do the same? Okay. Now, will you do a self-examination more often and educate as many people as you can about breast cancer? Okay, thank you. Imagine you're lying in bed and it's the middle of the night. You can't sleep, but you have no energy and you move from the couch to your bed several times. Your whole body is covered in prickly goosebumps, and you cannot stop from chilling, shaking, or even on your stomach. You rush to the bathroom several times today to vulgarly puke up what feels like the inside of your stomach, and on your way there, <clears throat> your legs are constricting and agony, you sound moving. The whole time you're dealing with these miserable physical symptoms, your mind has a mental craving that does not go away. The only thought coming through your mind is more medication. This is the experience of suffering withdrawals from prescription drugs. Open your eyes. Drug abuse stock goes states that more than 6 million Americans alone are addicted to prescription drugs. Today I will talk about why cannabis shouldn't be made legal for medicinal purposes. By the end of my speech, you will be convinced to join the movement of making this natural herb legal for medical use. I want to discuss why we need to truly consider legalizing cannabis for medicinal use. The side effects of cannabis and some of the consequences of non-legalization. So first I want to talk about cannabis does not distribute negative side effects like prescription drugs do. You will not experience withdrawal or addiction problems, and this info comes from Procon.org. The reason why cannabis works as a medication is because it takes your mind off the pain and helps you to feel relaxed. And this graph demonstrates an increase in percentage of Americans who believe doctors should prescribe medicinal cannabis. It starts off in 1997 with 67% of the population agreeing, and it then increases by 9% from 1997 to 2005 because in the late 90s the debate on whether to use medicinal cannabis or not became more open. And it then increases from 78% in 2005 to 81% in 2010 due to more exposure as cannabis being used as a medicine. Making cannabis legal for medicinal purposes would help the economy out drastically. $7.7 billion, $7 billion are spent annually by the United States government to enforce cannabis prohibition. 300 economists estimate that legalizing cannabis for medicinal use would save the U.S. $14 billion a year. That's almost double what it costs to enforce the laws behind it. Ounce for ounce cannabis is worth more than gold. Now that you all have an idea of what cannabis is and why we should legalize it, I'd like to explain and inform you on the side effects of cannabis. This info comes from Garth Greenwell of the Journal of Pain and Palliative Care Pharmacotherapy. Some statements claim that cannabis is addictive or habit forming. Cannabis is not habit forming and less addictive than caffeine. So you're more likely to get addicted to drinking coffee once a day than you would be consuming cannabis each day. Some drug rehab centers actually use cannabis for patients who are addicted to hard drugs like prescription drugs or cocaine or meth to help ease the withdrawal process they may experience. People like to claim that smoking cannabis causes cancer. This is false. No medical research ever conducted about cannabis states that someone has been diagnosed with cancer from cannabis use. Cannabis has been around longer than cigarettes, and there's, they've been doing tons of research on it. And I think they would have found something by now if it did cause cancer. In fact, uh, cannabis slows down cancer growth and tumor growth. Besides that, cannabis can be consumed in numerous ways, such as through edibles, drinks, drops, lotions, the process known as vaping, and pretty much any other way you can think of. There is a theory that claims some people have overdosed on cannabis, and this is nearly impossible and has never happened before in history. 
The lethal dose of trade of cannabis is extremely high. One would have to eat 46 pounds or smoke three pounds all in one city. So you can see cannabis does not present any real danger to, or harm to the human body, but there may be some consequences if the herb is not legalized. Now, I'd like to discuss the consequences of non-legalization, and this comes from Ray Ring of HCN High Country News. This picture obviously represents crime, and crime rates in the U.S. are high due to cannabis prohibition. This can easily change if cannabis is made legal for medical purposes. If you look at alcohol when it was prohibited in the U.S., the crime rates are at all-time high. So if they made it legal for medical purposes, the crime rates have been dropped. If cannabis is not made legal for medical use, more and more addiction problems will occur. Such as this girl, she's living a life of despair because she's addicted to prescription drugs. The reason why people get addicted to prescription drugs is because they're prescribed to take them every day, so their body gets used to having them. Once you try and take them away, then the body thinks that it needs them to continue functioning. And this last picture is the national symbol for medical marijuana. Think of all terminally ill cancer patients who have benefited from making cannabis legal for medical purposes. Realistically, cannabis is the perfect medication because it is all natural, which means that it's less damaging to the body than prescription drugs. And so many people today are suffering from horrible diseases and all suffering could go away if they are allowed to use cannabis as a medication. Cannabis is not bad. It is na a natural product, product that comes from nature. How is it that substances which are man-made like alcohol and cigarettes are legal, but something from nature is illegal? Look at food, for instance. If you eat like fast food, you're going to get fat and overweight. But if you eat fruits and vegetables, you're going to be healthy and in shape. Legalizing cannabis for medicinal use would be a smart decision for our government to make, and it does not make sense as to why they have not legalized it already. It's time for our government to grow up and truly consider legalization. Now, how many of you will go home tonight and throw out all your prescription drugs and consume cannabis instead? <laughs> how are you looking more into the legalization of medical cannabis as you can be helping someone who is suffering from a terminal illness? Thank you. Mr. Mark, sorry I'm a little sick, so I might sound a little stuffy. Um, I'll start with you guys closing your eyes for me. Um, I want you to really imagine what I'm explaining and what, I, what, what I'm saying, the process of what I'm saying. Within 10 minutes, 10, 10 tablespoons of sugar, that's 100% of your daily recommended service, is set down, inserted into your body. And the only reason you don't throw up is because of phosphoric acid cuts the flavor down. Within 20 minutes, blood sugar spikes and the liver results with the insulin burst by turning massive amounts of sugar into fat. 40 minutes, your whole body absorbs all the caffeine, pupils dilate, blood pressure rises, and liver dumps more sugar into bloodstream. 45 minutes in, body increases dopamine production, stimulated the pleasure, which stimulates the, the pleasure center of your brain. Physically identical response to that of heroin. Within 60 minutes, sugar body crackers. You can open your eyes now. That is what happens to you within one hour of drinking one can of soda. Um, according to the Beverage Marketing Corporation, the average American does about 44.7 gallons of sweet stuff every year. That's nearly 67,000 calories in just drinks. Um, if you turn that into fat, like pounds, that's 20 pounds of fat just coming from soda. Soda is the earth up. Today I will be talking about water versus soda. Um, the effects of consuming soda, the effects of consuming water, and how you can make a switch so you can consume less soda and more water. Um, yeah, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> effects of <laughs> now that we know what we're talking about, we can move on to our first topic. Effects of consuming soda. Um, one dangerous concern of effects soda is reduces your enamel. Um, according to the American Vento Association, um, it incurs destruction of enamel, which has that nice little clear coat they have in your teeth, and you have teeth looking like this. And I don't know many people I want to talk to somebody that has teeth. <laughs> um, um, a major factor in childhood, um, childhood obesity is sodas. Many kids, um, they replace absolutely every single little drink they have with soda. And starting from the morning orange juice to the day nightly milk. Everything's replaced with soda nowadays. <coughs> um, it also causes osteoporosis, which is it weakens your body, your bones. 
so when you're older, you can easily break your bones, like just walking down the stairs, like, you know, it's a, in men's, it is, in men's, in the 2009 research for Massachusetts General Hospital, um, large amounts of sugar can reduce testosterone. And if you're a man, that's not something you want. You want as much testosterone as possible. Um, and in women, it is in a 2011 issue of the Clinical Journals of the American Society, it is known that it reduces kidney function. And as a woman, you want your kidney function. And as a man, too. <coughs> we know the next. Effects of drinking water. Um, it is said that bottled water is safer than tap water. For those that you know, have a problem, oh, I don't just want to buy bottles of water. You can drink water from the tap water. Um, the bottled water is regulated by the FDA, which have the similar requirements as the EPA public water supplies. So there's really not that much contamination difference between the bottles and tap water. Diet soda helps you lose weight. That's completely false. In contrary, in fact, drinks made with sugar substitutes that are known to make you gain weight. And soda can mitigate the effects of weakness. Um, Miss sleep takes a toll by adding caffeine, you're adding to the problem. <coughs> Next. The water um, helps maintain a daily basic balance of bloody fluids. 60% of, of your body's water, so you definitely need your water. Um, water can help control calories, so instead of chugging down a Coke, drink some water, that's 160 calories less a day that you're drinking for each, Coke, Coke, for each can of Coke. Um, it energizes muscles. Um, cells need water to stay healthy. Um, and you need water in electrolytes. If not, your, your muscles will shrivel up and will cause muscle fatigue. It also helps skin look nice and fresh. So you don't have dry over dry skin, looking scattered like a fish or anything like that. Um, and it helps kidney function. Then making the switch. Um, as you can see, Soda has 160 calories. This is all for uh, 12 ounces of soda. 160 calories, 47 grams of sugar, 50 carbohydrates, and 47 sodas in gram. As opposed to water, that has absolutely nothing on either one. If you would like to replace, um, you can also replace it with orange juice or grape juice. Obviously, being 100%, because if you get only 5%, you're just taking in sugars that you don't need. All bad sugars. You know, no one can do that. Conclusion, um, I'd like you guys to please try to take Coke and sodas out of your life and try to be smooth. So how many of you guys from this point on will replace every single soda drink with water and make everybody in your household do the same? There we go, thank you guys. <laughs> or at least I'll start to replace at least one of my soda drinks with water and make drinking water more common thing. Awesome. <laughs> All right, I'm Jeremy. Um, please close your eyes. Um, imagine you are at a party, a really important party, a party celebration like a wedding. The most important moment is about to come, that big kiss at a wedding, that changing the girl's shoes at a sweet 16, or the kid blowing the candles on his birthday. The most import important moment is about to come, and right before that moment, the photographer has to stop taking pictures to switch film rolls because he just used his 24 photos that the film roll, that the film roll had. The, the couple kiss, the kid blows his candles, and the photographer lost the opportunity to capture that unique moment. Open your eyes. According to uh, uh, an article on photography.com, film versus digital statistics. In 2010, uh, Survey presented that 82% out of 1,000 people uh, say that own and use a digital camera. 50% um, uh, of that 1,000 people were professional photographers, and the other 50% where regular, everyday digital camera users. I will be talking about um, 
some of the advantages of the digital cameras and by the end of my speech you'll know more advantages of digital cameras versus film cameras. Some of my main points are saving money, is it the perfect time to buy a digital camera? Digitalable, uh, I just made that up, it's digital is becoming more reliable and reaching more human hands than ever before. And manipulation over your images, is people seeing your images the, the way you want to. Okay. According to Consumers Electronics Association, again the same organization I've researched before, uh, over from 2006 to 2011, the average unit price of digital cameras has gone down since 2006. In 2006, it was 247, the average price of a digital camera. In 2007, it went down to 203. In 2008, 181. In 2009, it went up a little bit to 195, 195. In 2010, 100 and 185, it went down. And in 2011, it went down even more at 173. In companies like Canon, in 2006, they made uh, 17 models of digital cameras. And oh, other than Canon, the Canon, other companies made other models of digital cameras, so the price went down a lot. Uh, in 2008, they only made nine models of digital cameras. So along with other companies, they didn't produce as much, and that's why the price stayed up a little bit. I'm sorry, in 2008. And, now, and then in 2009, Canon made 32 models of digital cameras. Along with other companies, they produce a lot of digital cameras, and the competition makes the price go down until now. Um, according, that's some of the, the information on prices on saving money. Now, according to an article in CanadianLeaving.com, some myth about digital cameras. When we take a picture, we make a perfect. Go back. Okay, <laughs> didn't work. When we take a picture, we make a perfect objective recording of reality. That's not true. What we make is an interpretation of reality. Digital photography is expensive. Yes, but no. In 1994, one of the first digital cameras aimed at professional photographers was sold for $18,000. Now today, the same professional camera can be found for $2,000. Being a professional photographer <coughs> is all about being able to take great photographs. Yes, a, temp a photographer can deliver quickly, handle expectations, and provide um, execution to get the job done. But nowadays, uh, many people, regular people like you and me, can take equally visually stunning photographs as well. The first, um, this is the first scandal in, that became international uh, regarding photo manipulations. It was in June of 1994 when O.J. Simpson uh, was accused of whatever he did. Um, Newsweek used the original picture with no editing and then Time Magazine uh, edited the picture making him look bad and more, more threatening and darkening, more threatening. Um, that was in 1994 when photo manipulation became international. Then in 2001, I say that, you, you might think that seeing is believing, but in the digital world, no, it's not true. That, this is totally fake, this is a fake, fake picture. After the incidents of 2001, this picture was published 
published in January of 2012, uh, 2002. Uh, this guy just photoshopped an airplane and he became famous. And then, but it's not all that bad. Also, also photographers, um, photo manipulation is great. It's a great source of inspiration for people like you and me. Generally, because creators are able to express their their creativity through through various aspects of design. Now, just by a show of of hands, um, who would agree with me that if a male photographer is having a small fun together with his friends, it would be okay for him to try and have some fun with his friends using a film camera? It would be okay. okay. Also, if the same photographer is at a wedding or another big event, he should shoot in digital so he can get those hundreds or even thousands of pictures and not having to stop for film. Thank you.